Hello. Thank you, Susan. All right. Thank you so much. So good to be here. And yeah, it ain't over yet, is it? So, um, and I get it. I know that we are weary. Uh, you are weary. As veterinary professionals, this is, you know, I know not been an easy time. How do I know that? Because I've been supporting you you know, through this, and you have all communicated so well to me. I have been doing webinars across the country since the world turned upside down last March. And, um, you know, I, I have some of, of an appreciation of what it's like to be you and, and to the best of the ability of, you know, not being working alongside of you. But with that, we do need to, again, we're not at the finish line yet. And um, this is a curriculum in resiliency that COVID has offered us. So like it or not, we, we, are, we are in the classroom. And I know we wouldn't have chosen this, but um, this is where we find ourselves. So you already heard a little bit about me uh, very briefly. I've worked in veterinary medicine for 25 years, starting way back in the dark ages as a veterinary assistant. I was a hospital administrator and I spent many years in industry sales and training. And uh, I have worked in the field long enough to see so many changes, but yet not see so many changes in other areas. I've seen so much changing as it relates to the medicine and the advancement of medicine, and that's been amazing. But unfortunately, where I haven't seen so many changes up until very recently is in how are we coping and dealing with the, the stressors of the work? Like That's really what brought me to this work is unfortunately having to know too many veterinarians that had taken their own life, uh, veterinary professionals that, you know, were um, finding themselves with substance abuse and, and, and all of that really weighed heavily on my heart and my mind and made me want to do something about it. So yes, I started my own business and uh, I now, you know, support you each and every day as it relates to your mental health and well-being. Something else you must know about me, because if you're hearing snoring in the background, it is not me. These are my, <laughs> these are, th this is my family, Ernie and Mabel. Ernie is the one in the wheelchair. And, um, and, uh, and, and, oh, interesting little fun fact. Uh, we have used the Assisi loop uh, on him when he first got diagnosed. Um, and this is Mabel, the, the little, the little black uh, female. So this is Ernie and Mabel. This is part of my family. And I, again, really want to thank the CC folks for having me with you. I know that they care deeply about you all. And I know that the veterinary field is very special to them. And I really applaud them for, again, supporting you in this way. And I'm really honored to be able to do that with you today. So let's start with mental health. Let's start with understanding that mental health, the way we define mental health, we need to talk about. Because a lot of the definitions that I see about mental health, especially here in the US, is that we define mental health as being the absence of mental illness. And I want you to consider that that may not be true, right? It's like, it would be like me saying that just because I don't have diabetes doesn't mean that I'm physically healthy. Same thing goes for mental health. Mental health is something that, first of all, we have to go and get. It doesn't just come like at us, it doesn't, it doesn't fall in our lap. We actually have to spend energy and effort and time in order to create it for ourselves, just like we do with physical health, right? Like that just doesn't land in our lap either. Maybe some, to some degree, but only to a certain point, right? Eventually we have to eat well and exercise and sleep. Like, yes, that all takes effort. So it's the same thing as it relates to our mental health. And I really want to encourage you to think about your mental health as one of your most important assets, but also one of the most important things that you spend your time, energy, effort, and yes, yeah, sometimes even your money. I was just coaching a client last night and I was telling her, I said, you know, I have spent tens of thousands of dollars on my mental health. Literally, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on my brain and um, I, and it was worth every penny of it. And it still is. And I will always continue to spend money on my brain because I think it's the most powerful tool we have. And why? Because it is the only, it is what creates resiliency for me. It is what creates how I think, how I behave, how I feel. All is coming from my mind. So to me, it is the most important thing I spend my money on. And if you've ever been without your mental health, like I have, then you really understand its importance. 
So the CDC defines mental health to include our emotional, our psychological, and even our social well-being. Well, you know, social well-being is definitely taking a hit right now during a pandemic. But they also go on to talk about how the correlation between how we think, feel, and act. There's an interplay there how we think, feel, and act. Those three things are connected. And I will talk with you about that here in a little bit. But the CDC also goes on to talk about, yeah, the way we handle stress, insert whatever you want to be your stressor right now, veterinary medicine, the pandemic, um, your schedule, your personal life, your kids, whether they're going to school or not, uh, you know, getting the vaccine, what you're choosing to do there. Oh, the political climate. Like there's a lot of things here that are, again, generating stress for us. So here's what's interesting about mental health is ment the goal of mental health really is about being resilient. We're going to get knocked down a whole bunch of times in this amazing thing we call life. Like life is about getting knocked down. I like to say kind of getting hit behind the knees. You know how when you get when a dog, <laughs> you've all experienced this, like there you are. And like one of those rambunctious golden retrievers comes running out from somewhere, hits you in the back of the knees and you kind of fall down. Yeah, that's life. We are going to get hit in the back of the knees multiple times, many times per day, per week, whatever. Uh, the goal isn't to stop getting hit behind the knees. The goal is, can I dust myself off and get back up? Why is this important? The reason this is important is because you are always susceptible to three different things. First and foremost, as it relates to work, compassion fatigue, of course, like that's, you know, my, my main area of, of expertise is around compassion fatigue and what do we do about it? right? So compassion fatigue is what you're experiencing on the regular because you are being impacted by others' pain and suffering, your patients, your clients, your coworkers, the world. Then there's burnout, which you are also susceptible to. And especially right now, I think many of you are experiencing compassion fatigue and burnout. And, you know, I think that that's a normal reaction to what's going on right now. The workload has been crazy. Your schedules are jam-packed. You don't have any appointment slots. The clients keep calling. They can't get in. They're cranky. So, yeah, burnout, though, is a little bit different from compassion fatigue. Burnout is what happens when we have too much work and not enough resources. There's no trauma component to burnout. That's why you can be burned out if you work at Starbucks. But chances of you having compassion fatigue at Starbucks are slim to none right? Because there's not pain and suffering. <laughs> Although <laughs> when I can't get my coffee, there might be pain and suffering, but that'd be on me. So thirdly, you also are susceptible to primary traumatic stress. Yeah. When you're bitten and scratched by, I'm mostly talking about patients, but sometimes your clients, their words are biting and scratching. Um, or, you know, another situation, again, um, you know, I, I'm working with a practice right now that one of their doctors has a terminal illness. Like that's primary traumatic stress as well is like when we're being impacted by, again, things that are going on around us and how we're having a direct impact on that. So let's talk about current stressors here. Like welcome to 2021. It was been the same slide in 2020. There's covid right? Just got done doing a webinar for a practice. You know, half of them are in quarantine right now. They're having to wear PPE all the time. That's a stressor. Your clients and how they're behaving. Yes, that's a stressor. The logistics of curbside service, if that's what you're doing, which I'm going to guess the vast majority of you are, pretty inefficient business model. Pack schedules, like we talked about. Wanting to provide the best for your patients and clients. And maybe you feel like right now you're not able to because of all the hoops and hurdles you're having to jump through. Knowing that what you do in your off hours can impact your coworkers and the practice at large, that's a stressor and vice versa. Political and civil unrest. Yeah, it seems like, you know, that's pretty much gone hand in hand with this pandemic. That's a stressor. And of course, then trying to have a personal life and all the stressors that that brings into it. Yes, which is a whole nother category. Now, the deal is this, we're not supposed to be happy all the time. So we're not doing any of this wrong. The goal of our life isn't to feel amazing all of the time. The goal of our life is that 50% of the time we are going to feel amazing. We're going to feel happy and joyful and inspired and enthusiastic and excited. Oh, but then the other half of the time, we're going to feel frustrated, stressed, overwhelmed, dissatisfied, overwhelmed. I think I've said that twice. <laughs> that, that means that I really mean it when I say it twice. That's a true human life. 
all of the feels in equal proportion. And I bring this up because I think so many times what happens, especially as veterinary professionals is like, we think we're supposed to be loving our work all the time. We're like, well, I work with animals and I want to make them better and alleviate suffering. And I should love that all the time because our clients actually pay us to do this. And there must be something wrong with me that I don't love every single day. I was like, no, there's nothing wrong with you. You're experiencing a true human life where, yeah, half the time you're going to love it, half the time, not so much. Half the time you're going to feel amazing, half the time, not so much. In your day, in your week, in your month, in your life. It's the contrast, right? You wouldn't know what calm was if you didn't know what anxious was. There has to be the contrast. And, you know, uh, this quote by Rachel Remen, I think, is always beautifully ties all this in. She's basically giving us permission to say, hey, guess what? If you're going to witness or be immersed in pain and suffering every single day, it's going to have an impact, right? Of course it is. So let's understand that and be willing that, yeah, half the time our hearts are going to be broken sometimes too because of the work that we do. And that's okay. It's okay. No one, believe it or not, and I know it's contrary to popular belief, but like we can handle those emotions. We can handle the difficult emotions. They don't feel good, but we can handle them. That's what it means to be resilient. So, whoops, um, as it relates to cultivating resilience, I found this interesting definition, the capacity to absorb energy from disruption. I thought, oh my gosh, it's like, our 2020 and 2021 is like almost feel like in parentheses could be disruption. It's like we've been disrupted in so many ways and we're still being disrupted. Yes. And in a sense, we're like in this boat all together and we're out on the ocean and the waves are coming and they're coming from every direction and we don't know when the next one's going to hit. We don't know how big it's going to be or little it's going to be. And we're getting tossed around and we can't stop those waves but we can absolutely learn how to be with those ways. We can learn how to surf, if you will. That is what resiliency is. Can I learn to surf? So some other ways to define resiliency is adapting in the face of tragedy, trauma, obstacles, overwhelm, stress, stressors, threats, all of it. And yet part of it is about bouncing back. Yes, it is. But what's also interesting about the work around resilience is that sometimes it's actually possible to bounce back and be in a better place than you were before the tragedy, threat, stressor came about. And if you're honest with yourself, I bet many of you that are on the webinar today probably have experienced that in your life. You may have had something happen to you in your life that, yeah, at the time was awful, but in the aftermath of it, you actually bounced back beyond where you were in the beginning. And that actually has a name. We call that post-traumatic growth. I actually did a whole uh, podcast episode on that. So post-traumatic growth is really when there's a positive psychological change that happens as the result of something, where we find ourselves, again, functioning at a higher level than we were before. And that's kind of cool. What we find, and again, this is a very interesting piece of research, is that people who have experienced post-traumatic growth, they have these, these... Um, these aha moments where all of a sudden they realized that they were stronger than they ever thought, that now they know that they can handle difficulties, that their priorities changed because of what happened. And guess what? COVID offers us the ability for post-traumatic growth as well. We can be better on the other side of this thing. And it doesn't mean that it's, that it's going to be easy breezy all the way through here. No, we're going to get knocked down and we're going to struggle all of it all the way through. But That doesn't mean that, again, in the aftermath, once, whenever everything settles down, which whenever that is, maybe it's a year from now where all of a sudden we're like, you know what? I actually realized that I, again, I like grew from that experience. And some of you may already be experiencing that, which I hope. So as it relates to resilience, again, we know that it is um, our capacity for or the process of or the outcome of successful adaptation, no matter what's happening. And as science people, as yourselves, I always love to look at science to, I like geek out on science, right? I'm a zoology major. So um, anytime I can kind of connect what's happening, you know, of course, in the natural world to what we experience, even in vet med, I think is amazing, right? So this little creature over here is Turritopsis nutricula. And um, he's a hydrozo, 
hydrozoan, essentially he's a jellyfish that has a very unique adaptive um, response. When his uh, cells reach adulthood, they actually transition back to the polyp stage. So it's like, in other words, this jellyfish is essentially immortal. It never dies. So talk about resilience. Like that's an amazing way to be resilient is again, never dying. Well, we all don't get to experience that. So what does make up resilience? Well, here's another example of a resilient species, the emperor penguin, right? If you know anything, if you haven't seen March of the Penguins, please immediately see that movie. Um, what we know about the emperor penguins living in Antarctica is that, you know, the male and the female will travel for three days at a mile per hour. <laughs> like they go one mile per hour. That's very slow. <laughs> three days to the nesting site. She then again lays the egg. She then has to transfer the egg on top of her feet to the male because he's going to now safeguard it um, until it hatches, right? For two months, he's going to safeguard it because she then goes back to the coast to feed up. She needs to, again, get lots of nutrition. So for two months in 112 mile per hour winds, minus 80 degree Fahrenheit, that those, those males are all, again, they have an egg on top of their feet and under their belly where they're keeping it warm, where they're incubating it, right? Until she finally comes back two months later and then the egg hatches and she feeds it. That is a resilient species for sure. So we know the things that make up resiliency are inner strength, competence, optimism, flexibility, and of course, the ability to cope effectively when handling any sort of adversity. Like there are, again, the science shows us, we know what makes up resiliency. And we also know what makes up resilient people. What are the characteristics that make up resilient people? Well, first and foremost, they understand their sense of control. They know what they can control and what they can't control. And I'll give you the Cliff Notes version here. You can control yourself and you can't control anyone else. <laughs> so that's good to know. They have problem solving skills. So they see problems. They may see problems in the practice. And, but they don't go to management and just talk about the problems. They see the problems, but they also offer the solution. Again, I manage to practice. I can't tell you how frustrating it would be when people come to my office and be like, yes, Julie, we have this problem over here, but would never have the solution. Resilient people see the problem, but they also have an idea for a solution. They have strong social connections. They understand that we are not meant to do any of this alone. And to be resilient, we need to rely and lean on other people. They identify as survivors, not as victims. And it doesn't mean that in the moment we aren't a victim. You may very well have been a victim at some point in your life, or maybe even right now, something going on in your life. But we don't stay. They don't stay in the victim identity. Eventually, they move away, and then, they, I then identify themselves as a survivor. Really important. And the fifth piece here, which I think is really important as it relates to all of us, is that they have the ability to ask for help, not just at work, like, hey, I need help, you know, with these office visits, I need help wrapping these packs, I need help running these fecals, I need help running this blood work or packaging this blood work up. But it's also about asking for help in one's life. Oh, yeah, I'm struggling right now. I need some help, whether it's a therapist, a coach, support group someone just to lend an ear. That is really important. And the research as it relates to veterinary medicine, we have not scored well on the ability to ask for help. And boy, oh boy, do we need to shift that and we need to make the changes. So I'm relying on you. So come to find out resiliency is not a fixed trait. It's something we can learn. We can teach kids it. We can teach ourselves it. We can develop it. And it does relate to how we think, feel, and act. Remember, I talked about that early on. Our thoughts, feelings, and actions are all bundled up in helping us to, again, create resiliency. And come to find out, it's actually not extraordinary at all. It's quite ordinary resiliency. So what works? I'm going to share with you five things that the science shows are the five most important things to help us to create resiliency in our own lives. So first and foremost, and the research is really clear and, and um, on this, you'll, you can't get away from this one um, secret, if you will, about what, what works for resiliency. That is physical activity. They're like, there's no way around it. 
You get to define what physical activity is. So you want to make it something that you enjoy. And it doesn't have to be something that you're out there like killing it every day. It has to just be some sort of movement, physical movement. What we know is that physical movement promotes new cells in our brain, new brain cells, right? We also know that it helps to sort of um, disconnect our brain stress center so that we're not constantly going into fight or flight because as, as, as we're constantly going into fight or flight, we're actually not creating resiliency. Physical activity also is signaling to our brain when we are being physically active that the world is a safe place again. And this is really this concept of um, creating or completing the stress cycle, which is a whole nother webinar, but the, the, the research behind physical activity really is powerful. So you get to decide what that is, right? It could be running, it could be walking, it could be cycling, it could be, you know, uh, Tai Chi or yoga, but physical, and it can be as little as 20 minutes. So don't, you know, um, don't overthink this too much, but look for how you can incorporate physical activity in your life because it's that amazing and powerful. What else works other than physical activity? What I call thinking consciously. So as a life coach, I teach people how to what I call think consciously. So what does that mean? <laughs> you might be thinking, wait a minute, aren't we thinking consciously all the time? Uh, heck no, we're never thinking consciously. We have thoughts all of the time, right? Research says that we have about 60,000 thoughts per day. Most are negative, most are repeats. So there's no way that any of us are aware of our 60,000 thoughts per day. Like that would be a full-time job. We don't need to be. So that's kind of cool. But here's what we need to understand about our brain or our mind. I'm kind of using those terms synonymously. So we sort of have two parts to our brain, right? We have what's known as the primitive brain, the oldest part of our brain, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the part of our brain that developed first. That part of our brain, again, sees the world in binary terms. It sees the world as safe or dangerous, again, binary, good or bad, black or white, it doesn't see anything in the middle. So because of that, that's also why we all have a negativity bias. Your brain working perfectly normally is always finding problems with yourself, with others. It's always seeing the negative. That's a negativity bias. The negativity bias actually tells us that for every one negative experience we have per day, we're actually going to need three positive to counteract it. So you're sort of already set up to fail by the time you probably get to work. <laughs> All you need is like one jerk on the highway to like cut you off. Now you already need three positive interactions to sort of offset that. Negative experiences are very sticky to our brain. Our brain holds on to those things. Rick Hansen, he says that negative experiences are like Velcro. Whereas positive ones are like Teflon, they slip on by. We don't remember all of the clients that said all the amazing things about you all day long. But you do remember the one who said one negative thing. Oh, yes, we do. And remember, we have all evolved. Our ancestors were highly anxious. They were looking for problems. They were on high alert all of the time. It's starting to make sense why we are the way we are. But those traits were selected for survival. The people who had those traits survived. So again, that's amazing, but yet we need to learn how to work against that. But thankfully, here's the good news. We developed a brain over top of that primitive brain, and that's what we call our human brain. Part of that is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that actually cares about your long-term goals. Your amygdala hippocampus could give two rats about you wanting to you know, drop 10 pounds. It doesn't care about that at all. In the moment, it's like, uh-oh, danger, we better eat Doritos right? Uh-oh, danger. We got a text message. We better have some hog and dos. But your prefrontal cortex actually cares about you saying you want to lose 10 pounds. Your prefrontal cortex allows you the ability to think about your thoughts, to be like, oh yeah, look what I'm thinking about myself. I have this, I'm noticing that I think I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough or there's no way I can ever do this. That's what it means to think consciously. Why is this important? Because we have to now bring this back to feelings. Now, most of us have been taught and society teaches us that circumstances cause our feelings, 
right? Society teaches us, oh, that client who said, you guys don't care about my pet. You just care about the money. That's what causes us to feel angry. I'm angry because the client said X, Y, Z. No, that's not where your anger is coming from. Your, your client doesn't cause you to feel angry ever. Just like people not wearing a mask doesn't cause your emotional state, doesn't cause you to feel frustrated. I know. And trust me, I know this is sensitive. <laughs> the coronavirus, the, the, the incidence of it doesn't cause our anxiety. Nor does a patient being euthanized cause our sadness. Circumstances, things outside of you don't cause your emotions. What things outside of you, circumstances trigger is a thought in your brain. And it's your thoughts about those circumstances that cause how you feel. All right, stick with me. So here's what I'm teaching you. Circumstances, facts in the world trigger thoughts in our brain. We have a thought about something that causes our feelings. Our feelings fuel our behavior, our actions, and our actions create results. But when you can think consciously, when you start paying attention to what you're thinking, then you can change the way you feel. That's the way to change the way you feel. We have it all backwards, especially in vet med. We're like, oh, we need the clients to be more patient so we can feel better. No, we don't. That's not the way to feel better. They're not causing your frustration. Their impatience has no emotional impact on you. What you think about it does. So when you think, oh, they should be more patient, then you, again, feel angry or frustrated. When you think, oh, I get it. This is, this is not an easy time to be a human. I get why they're behaving the way they do. You feel different. Then you feel compassion or understanding. Your thoughts are causing your feelings. Nothing outside of you is causing your emotions. The virus doesn't cause your emotions. The stock market doesn't cause your emotions. Euthanasia, curbside service, nothing outside of you causes how you feel. What you think about all those things causes how you feel. The coronavirus is a great example of that. I can use a million examples, but you know, like some of us are, have anxiety about the virus because our thought is, oh my gosh, I don't want to get this. Other people have completely different thoughts about it. They have thoughts like this is a hoax. It doesn't even exist, <laughs> right? So that's why I'm demonstrating the virus doesn't cause us an emotion. It's what we think about it. And we have different thoughts about it that therefore create different emotions, so what you have to understand, and I love this quote by Viktor Frankl, he said, between stimulus, between something that happens and our response, there's a space. And our space, in that space is our power to choose our response, to choose our thinking, to choose how we feel about something. That's on us. And that's where our freedom is. By having the ability, because we have a human mind, we can choose what to think. That's what it means to think consciously. And yeah, it's not a switch we turn on. It's something that we practice moment by moment by moment. We choose, what am I going to think about this? What do I want to think about this situation? And this is important because, again, of this connection between what I think causes how I feel, causes how I behave, that's the whole piece about thinking consciously. And I love, 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 love understanding. It's the number one thing I teach is how to feel empowered. I want to empower you that guess what? The way you feel isn't coming from other people. We don't need other people to change to feel better. You know what we need to change to feel better is what we're thinking. And yeah, that's not just a, a, um, a, a wet blanket that we're, you know, draping over ourselves is no, it's like thought by thought by thought, the thoughts that are causing you to feel the way you don't want to feel. It's taking those one at a time and going, yeah, how can I think about the situation with this client in a different way? How can I think about the situation with my coworker in a different way? That's what it's about. All right. Next up is I have a bunch of builds in that slide, which make it not work correctly. Number three is what I call mental hygiene. Let's think about it. <laughs> Let's list all of the things that you clean all the time, especially now. You clean your hands, you clean your teeth, you clean your hair, you clean your body, you clean your surgical site, you clean your surgical instruments, you clean all your surfaces. But do you actually clean out your brain ever? Remember what I said? Remember how many thoughts you have per day? Yeah, it was a lot, like 60,000 thoughts per day. It gets very cluttered in here. We need to clean our minds out. 
regularly. That's what I call mental hygiene. So another way to talk about mental hygiene is the practice of journaling. That's what I'm talking about. So what is journaling? Well, first of all, it can look a whole bunch of different ways journaling can be. Um, you know, what we know from the science is that there's a list of benefits that are quite long, as you can see on the side of this slide here, right? Again, increasing our cognitive functioning, our immune system, negative effects of stress, fewer stress-related doctor visits, yeah, mood, um, better mood, decrease in depression and anxiety, feelings of greater psychological well-being. Yeah, it's a mess in here. We need that. This is part of mental health is do, do I know what I'm thinking? Am I aware of the conversation in my head? And journaling is such an effective tool for that. So what does it look like? There's a ton of different ways to journal. There's no right way. It's just any way you do it. Personally, I do about five to 10 minutes a day where I do just a stream of consciousness. I just empty my brain out. Whatever's going on in there, just empty it out. I do it in the morning. That serves me best, sets me up for my day for a successful day. You don't have to do it that way. Maybe you work in the mornings. Maybe that doesn't work for you. Maybe you want to do it at night. Great. Maybe you need some prompts. Maybe you want to journal. You want to start journaling with just this phrase, I'm thinking, dot, 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 or I'm worried about, or I'm feeling, or I'm grateful for, or I want to believe, dot, 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 dot. Whatever it is, it's literally about cleaning out the attic of your brain. Imagine your house. If you never vacuumed or cleaned up or dusted, especially if you have pets, <laughs> unless they're hairless, unless your pets are all fish, I mean, imagine if we never did hygiene in our homes or decluttered. It's the same exact thing. We have to declutter our brain. That's how you create mental health. And if you and I were to sit down and have coffee together and you said, what's the number one skill? Like if I could, like, what's one thing I could do to dramatically increase my mental health? I, it would be a toss up. I would be at first in my mind, I would be saying, oh, should I tell them journaling or should I say meditation? So I probably would say journaling, though, because I know so many people get all wonky about meditation. Oh, I can't meditate. I know I've tried it. Blah, blah. So I would probably go with journaling. I think it's the it's the most powerful thing you can do. And again, new year, new you. Right. Go to Target, buy yourself a cute little journal that says something cute on it. This one says dare to dream. I just love that. Makes me happy when I look at it. And and try it for yourself. Like the science is robust behind this. Um, like the studies actually show one interesting study that they did on journaling was with animal welfare workers. And they had them journaling for 10 minutes, three times a week. And they had them rate their um, their stressors in the beginning, their stress response in the beginning. And then at the end of, I forget, it was like six, six, eight or 10 week period. I'm not exactly sure there was a dramatic decrease in their stress response just by journaling. It gives you a different perspective, especially when it's your own handwriting and you start working things out and you start seeing what's going on in your brain. That allows you to also use step two again about thinking consciously because now you have an idea of what you're thinking and you can look at the piece of paper, you can read it back over and go, oh, wow, interesting. No wonder I feel the way I feel because these are all the things I'm thinking right? Your thoughts cause your feelings. Okay. Number four, self-care. Well, that's a whole webinar in and of itself, but I want to just talk with you briefly about as we are looking to be, be more resilient. If you haven't gotten the message yet about self-care and about taking care of ourselves to create sustainability and resiliency in veterinary medicine, then let's get the message now. Doesn't matter if we didn't get it before. New year, new you, right? 2021. Let's start fresh. Let's finally embody what it means to practice self-care in whatever way feels right to you. There's lots of options. Don't get confused about what self-care really is. It's not something we have to go to Amazon for. And it's not to say that, you know, we might not purchase something that contributes to our self-care, but it doesn't have to. Self-care is much more basic than that. There are five different aspects and you don't have to hit all of them every day or all of the time. It's just about raise your awareness that there's mental self-care, physical, spiritual, emotional, and social. Let me break them down for you. Mental self-care is so important for you all. Here's why. It balances the stimulation of your brain that you get every single day, learning new things, trying new things, reading articles. 
It balances that with giving your brain a break. I used to say that Netflix was not self-care and I was wrong. Here's where it's not self-care. Netflix is not self-care when you're avoiding your life and avoiding your emotions by binge watching. It is self-care when you just want to give your brain a break from decision making, from thinking about your cases, from thinking about work, and you just want to kind of go and experience a movie or a show. Then it is self-care. And again, mental self-care could be lots of other things, you know, taking a class, reading, um, listening to a podcast, like a million different things there. Physical self-care is what we most identify with. So this could be anything relating to health, nutrition, physical wellness. But yeah, that means going to doctor's visits. That means taking our meds if we're on medication. That means sleeping and eating foods that our great grandmother would recognize as food. That's a good, <laughs> that's a good um, way to know if it's something you should be eating regularly is if your great grandmother would recognize it. Um, <laughs> Like, I'm sorry, but those earthworm things, those worm, those jelly worms, your great grandmother would be like, what are you eating? That's not real food. So physical self-care exercise, of course, comes into play here. Um, daily body lotion is physical self-care. It can be simple. Oh, I'm going to watch right now. Here, I'm going to practice self-care. Watch how long this takes. Three seconds. I just hydrated myself. Next is spiritual self-care. Spiritual self-care, again, is anything that aligns you with what you believe your purpose to be. I'm going to talk with you about purpose here in a second. So sometimes for some of you, that may be something that, you know, connects you to something greater than yourself that you call God or higher power or universe or may not, right? May be religious or may not. Your spiritual self-care may just be being with trees, being out in nature, being at the ocean, being at the lake. Perfectly fine. Social self-care, oh boy, this is a tough one right now during a pandemic, is connecting with others in a positive way. I think we're all, we're all a little bit um, wanting in this aspect of self-care. So yeah, we have, to, we have to keep on keeping on. We have to keep on being creative about how to connect with others, Zoom, FaceTime, all this stuff. This, we're connecting with each other because we can't be at conferences together, hugging on each other. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. I'm just going to hug random people the next, the first conference I go to. I'm just going to be in the conference hall or, you know, if I'm speaking or something, I'm just going to go through and hug people, even if they don't want it. <laughs> okay, maybe not. <laughs> that would be weird <laughs> if you didn't want it. But I think we're all going to, even those of you that don't like hugs, I think are going to come around at first to be like, you know what? I'm going to allow myself to be hugged at least for a week or so. And then I'll go back to, I don't like being hugged. <laughs> and lastly is emotional self-care. So emotional self-care really is acknowledging and understanding how we feel. Journaling is a great way for emotional self-care. Working with a coach or therapist, of course, would be a great way to attune to our emotional self-care. Meditation might even be um, part of that. So I just wanted to give you just a little you know, insight into what that looks like. And I'll put up a, some other things here about um, self-care. So over here at home, sleep, we talked about shopping. Yeah. You know what? Like you can't eat healthy if you don't have anything in your cupboards or in your refrigerator. Um, there's this amazing thing. You can, I get it. You don't have a lot of time. You can order all this stuff on online and go and pick it up curbside. Great idea. Have somebody else do the shopping for you. I think it just costs like a couple extra bucks. Food prep, that's self-care. Like on a day off. Yeah. You may have to sacrifice a couple hours um, to throw some things into a slow cooker or an instant pot or put together some casseroles and then freeze them. But guess what? That's going to pay back huge dividends. When you're working long hours, you come home and you're hungry. Something's already made. You just need to pop it into the oven, right? Moving your body, having a routine, rest. For the love of all things, would you please rest? And rest doesn't mean scrolling on your phone. Rest means rest. <laughs> it means like doing nothing for a short period of time, having some solitude, which I think we're all, even though we are isolating ourselves, we still, especially you guys, again, I don't see anybody. I'm like locked in my prison here, right? I see my husband every day and the people at the grocery store. When I go to the grocery store, you guys are still interacting with people, whether it's in the parking lot and each other. So you do, and your families, you do need some solitude sometimes. Managing your tech, right? Don't let your phones rule your life. 
put all those, don't let this buzz at you and tell you what to do. You decide when you want to engage with it. Journaling, I talked about meditation. Uh, my favorite app right now is the mindfulness app. It's, go to mindfulness.com. I think they have like a free trial. It's a great app. There's others, Calm, Headspace app, lots of different ones. At work, taking a break is self-care. Mm -hmm. I know. I don't care if it's 15 minutes or 10 minutes, but uh, I have a problem when we are, you know, where no one is taking a break. And then we wonder why everybody is burned out, like where we are creating a culture where, you know, it's just commonplace that nobody ever gets a break. I, I, again, we have to push back on that. We have to figure out what we need to do to be able to create an environment of well-being for our employees. You are not a tool. You are not another machine in veterinary medicine. You are a human being who needs some downtime. And again, whether that's 15 minutes, that's better than nothing. Not as much as I'd like, but better than nothing. Bringing food and snacks so you have something to eat so you don't have to get something out of the vending machine. Staying hydrated, wearing your PPE, that is self-care. Comfortable clothes, you know, you're all mostly wearing scrubs, but make sure they're comfortable ones, comfortable shoes. Coming in early, and I don't mean an hour early. I know you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> getting off this webinar. What does she mean? I mean like five minutes early. I mean that if your shift starts at eight o'clock, you're ready to rock and roll at eight o'clock. You are like, bring it instead of like showing up just at eight and you're throwing your coat off and you're putting your badge on, you're grabbing your stethoscope and your, your pens and your clock, you punching in all that kind of stuff. And leaving on time, you know, that's a joke to some degree in veterinary medicine. It is, but it isn't. Yes, I get it. Medicine doesn't care about the clock, but yet how often do you not leave on time because you tell yourself you can't leave on time? And I am a big proponent of having each other's back. I think we need to get people out on time and we need to be able to support each other to be like, hey, it's five o'clock. You're supposed to be out of here, Sarah. See you. We got this. We don't do that for each other very often but we can. Asking for help, which I have talked about. DND, meaning do not disturb. Let's say you are um, someone who's putting in all the charges, right, of surgeries or something like that. Maybe you need to be somewhere where you can put a little sign up that says, hey, do not disturb for 20 minutes. I'm, you know, I need to concentrate on, on this. That would be self, that's self-care, to ask to not be interrupted because otherwise you make mistakes, and those mistakes are very costly to the bottom line of the practice, number one. But number two, then when you get interrupted, research shows, there's an interesting study done that shows that when you get interrupted, it takes 30 minutes to sort of get your concentration back. 30 minutes. You know, we've got that kind of time. All right. Nature. Um, nature is self-care. Get outside. I don't care where you live in the country. I live in upstate New York. It's cold, but I get outside every single day. There is no cold. I mean, I've been out there. Well, I haven't been out here in minus 22, but we travel to Canada every year and it's very cold up there. <laughs> and um, we still go out for, you know, three mile walk at minus 22 degrees. You know, we wear the right clothing and, um, you know, it feels good to be outside. And I think, I think, right now with all of the stuff that's going on in the world and our social media feeds and the news and it's, ah, I think we need some solace and peace and you can find that in nature. So don't forget about your good friend nature. Okay, last thing that works is staying aligned with your why. What am I talking about with your why? What is your why? Well, I love this quote by Mark Twain. The two most important days in your life are the day you were born and then the day you find out why. So what I'm talking about here is your why is your purpose. So let me give you some insight here. Um, there won't come a day where you get a email with subject matter that says your purpose. And you're like, an email doesn't come from the universe telling you what your purpose is. A text message doesn't come from the universe telling you, hey, oh, today's the day. I'm going to find out what my purpose is. Your purpose is something that you decide. You get to decide what your purpose is. Isn't that great? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I love thinking about that. And why is this important? Well, as we are looking for some protection against compassion fatigue and burnout, here's what I know can help protect us is knowing and aligning with what we believe to be our purpose. 
right? You've heard that phrase, um, um, something like, um, you know, staying with, with, with any why we can endure any how. In other words, when our why is big enough, when we're connected to our why, any how, in other words, the, the how of it all becomes endurable because we're so connected to what it is that we're here to do. And here's where it goes wrong. We think, many of us, that our purpose is what we do. We think our purpose is what it says on our scrub top. Veterinarian, veterinary technician, veterinary assistant, you know, um, CSR. None of those things are, are your purpose. That is not your purpose, what you do, right? Your purpose isn't showing up just for a paycheck or mentally tallying what you get versus the practice or comparing yourself to your coworkers. No, that's not your purpose. Or engaging in negativity and drama. Nope. Or waiting to be told what to do every day. Mm -mm. Or taking things personally. No. <laughs> or blaming others for how you feel. No. Or doing the bare minimum. No. None of those things are your purpose. Your purpose is who you get to be when you do what you do. This is why it's very unique. I can take 300 veterinary technicians and put them in the room right? They're all veterinary technicians, but their purpose is all very different because their purpose is who they get to be while they are a veterinary technician. Who you get to be is unique to you. It's the way you do it. That's what's so unique about it. That's your purpose. So who do you get to be is the question. Oh my gosh, this is when it gets fun. You get to show up every day with a positive attitude. That's who you can be. Or how about someone who inspires others? Or how about someone that's strengthening and lengthening the human animal bond? Ooh. Or how about someone who's keeping pets healthy longer? Oh, great purpose. Or anticipating the needs of others. You know what the clients want even before they're able to ask for it. Or educating, teaching, supporting clients and each other. That's who you can be. Or being an example of what's possible. We're all looking at each other all the time and we're all looking for someone to be inspiring, to motivate us, to show us how to do it with grace and to be able to lead with love and compassion, dedication and commitment. That's who you get to be. Oh, and who you get to be is someone who works so hard. Why? Because that's who you are. You're not expecting anything for it. You're not expecting people to notice it. You don't want to bump in your paycheck. Hey, that'd be nice. I get it. <laughs> but you're working hard because that's who you are. That's your purpose. So I have a little equation. Here's your homework. It's very simple. You can take a screenshot. Not quite yet. Don't take a screenshot of this yet. But I have a, a little um, formula for you to figure out or to fill out. Not even, well, figure out and fill out. Yes, both. So if you're familiar with Simon Sinek, he wrote a book called uh, What's Your Why? And this formula comes from him. So here's, here's the way to um, claim, if you will, your purpose. So the formula is to blank so that blank. I know right now it looks like nothing. And you're like, hmm, this is confusing. I'm going to share with you my purpose and then it will make sense. And I want you to figure out your own. So you can take a screenshot of this right now because this is your homework. You're going to work on this. You're going to figure it out because we have to know what our why is. And I'm going to show you that it's much deeper than I want you to go a level below, um, you know, to make animals healthy so they live longer. Like, that's great, but I want you to go a level deeper. That's still kind of on the surface. So here's my why. My why is to empower. And that word means the world to me. Like that word is tattooed on my insides. <laughs> it's seriously, if I ever get cut open. They're going to open me up and you're going to see the word empower all over. It's like running through my veins to empower veterinary professionals so that they can improve animals lives and love their own while they do it. That's my purpose. That's what I get up every single morning for. I'm so connected to this purpose to empower you so that, yeah, you can do your job as the amazing medical professionals that you are and you are but you can also love all aspects of your life while you do it. Love your work, be the person that you want to be in your personal life, have great relationships and all of that, have great health, mental health, physical health. Like that's all part of what my purpose is. So again, that's your homework to figure out your own purpose. All right. 
Um, let's bring this home, my friends. Some reminders here about resilience. It requires doing something. It does. You know, those five things, right? It was about physical activity. It was about thinking consciously, about being aware of what I'm thinking, and then making sure am I choosing what I want to think. Number three was about the mental hygiene, right? Journaling, that requires doing something. Four was self-care, that requires doing something. Aligning with my purpose, knowing my why, that requires doing something. Making sure I know what my purpose is. Oh, and then plastering it all over the place so I remember what my purpose is all of the time. What I'm here to do. And it may change. You can change your purpose. There's no purpose police. <laughs> That's perfect. The purpose police. You can change it. But know why you're doing what you're doing right? Put intention behind it. And yeah, there's no question that sometimes what might be, what might create resilience may not always be pleasurable in the moment, right? It may not be pleasurable to have your alarm, you know, buzz at, at five o'clock in the morning because you want to get up and um, go for a walk or go for a run. It may be more pleasurable to, to be in bed than get out of bed into the cold and dark. But Again, resiliency requires just a little bit of discomfort because we know the long-term payoff is big. And that's what that requires. And yeah, it is a discipline and it's proactive behavior. So, you know, think about, you know, right now how far you have come. Um, you're here with me now. So that tells me that you've been through this all. You've been dealing with, you know, an unprecedented situation, AKA COVID. None of us were prepared for that. None of us have ever lived through anything like this. Um, you have been dealing with unbelievable stressors at work, the client situation, the intense, you know, scheduling, the workload that's never ending. Now you've got, you know, your coworkers quarantine, and then you got less people, less staff and understaffing and all the pressures that puts on. It's unbelievable, but yet you're still here. You're still standing. Like I said in the beginning of this webinar, like COVID is our classroom and I want you to join me. And you know what? Let's be better on the other side of this. Talk about post-traumatic growth. But we're not only going to develop resilience of all of this, but we're going to be better for it. We're going to learn things about ourselves. And yeah, it's going to be painful sometimes. And it's going to hurt sometimes emotionally and physically even sometimes. But we are going to come out the other side, better versions of all of us. We are going to grow and transform through it all. Because I believe that's the purpose of our life anyways, is to grow and transform.